that's a powerful tool and, and capability that we've we've only been able to have humans do it. And it's a very limited set. And being able to have hundreds and hundreds of AI bots that can behave like that is is fantastic. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Leadership Growth Hour, an interactive monthly event that features timely leadership topics and tools to grow your leadership performance. I'm your host, Daniel Stewart, executive consultant and coach and president of Stewart Leadership, a global consulting, coaching, and training firm aligning organizations on leadership, teaming change, and talent. In short, we develop the people side to enable your growth strategies. Today, I'm excited to be joined by AI expert and evangelist, Dr. Ellen Badeau. Welcome, Ellen. Hi, Daniel. Great to be here. Appreciate the uh, opportunity. Absolutely glad to have you join us. The show is divided into two parts. The first half is content conversation on a specific leadership topic. And the second part is open Q&A from the audience on any topic, including continuation on the topic we've already started. As we are talking, please write your questions and comments in the Q&A feature. The chat feature is not enabled during, the, during this webinar. Now on to today's area of focus, welcoming, welcoming AI to your team. Okay, Alan, let's first give you a question here, just background. Give us a sense of your background and experience with AI, and then we'll dive into the subject at okay. hand. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I've uh, been in the field of AI for about 20 years. I started out using genetic algorithms to optimize designs for the U.S. military, weapon systems, you know, performance, those sort of things. And then as the uh, complexities cha you know, changed across the, the field and we got greater compute power and, you know, more impressive storage and those, those sort of things. It really branched out into, into other AI fields like natural language processing, genetic algorithms, chatbots, those sort of things. And now, you know, we're, we're really trying to solve system of system problems with things like neuromorphic computing and, and those types of uh, other fields of AI. Fantastic. So you're saying it's been around longer than simply 18 months, uh, AI. Right. Much longer. <laughs> Much longer. I love it. So today, let's take all of this conversation that has been going on, especially the last, what, 10, 12 months, and let's apply it to leaders and teams. And let's, in fact, use this analogy of this, this idea of AI as a member of one's team. Let's play with this analogy. We use this analogy. What are the pros and cons? of using this uh, as this idea of almost welcoming as AI, as a new member of your team, how could this benefit us as we use this as a way of thinking or maybe hurt us in a way? T talk to us in terms of your thinking around that. Yeah, I would say the, the greatest benefit is going to be around speed. You know, there's so much data. People have so much data at their at their fingertips. The problem is they can't type fast enough and the brains can't process it quick enough. And when you have these types of tools that are out there today, whether they're generative AI tools, chatbots, those sort of things, the, the, the speed and the uh, ability to, to process all of that data is, is, is really tremendous. But, it, you know, it's the ability to leverage that and gain additional perspective from different points of view at the same time. And, and, and in reality, it's not that you're just welcoming one member of your team. If you think about it, probably each member on your executive staff, for example, would have their own AI uh, tool set that they prefer to use. So you're actually welcoming multiple members onto your team. And that's when it gets a little bit scary. Because if you have six people ask the same AI the same question, you're going to get six different answers. Skill sets, you know, how, how folks are, are interacting with the tool set are going to drive some of the, the responses that you get from these uh, generative AI toolkits that are out there. 
And I, there's over 120 of them right now. I have 50 different accounts. I stopped at 50 because that was enough. I had to, had to quit. But, you know, the realities are around around those tool sets, it's, um, you know, it's going to be a challenge as you try to bring those perspectives in. And uh, it's not just a change management function anymore. It's it's really a, a skill set, you know, on top of that as well. You mentioned the number of AIs. So I'd love to ask the audience, all listeners here in the Q&A. Type in the AI of choice these days. What's the top AI? What's the first or second or third AI that you're using, that you're going to these days, or that you're experimenting with? Take a second, write down. There might be a few of you that you're like, uh, I'm not using it very much. And there might be some of you, they're like, here are the five or 10. Which ones? Jot down and let's take a take a look to see what are they? Because I'm saying AAI, because it's not just chat GPT. There are so many out there, but let's see what these are. And so as we're seeing this, Ellen, comment on some of the different varieties of AIs that you're seeing. What are some that you're using? Yeah, what's funny is, um, you know, when I look at the list, everybody is saying uh, chat GPT-4. Uh, thank you, Peter, for being specific on uh, version four, you know, because there's also the free version of 4.5. There's uh, a bunch of other versions, depending on, you know, how many characters you can, you can type into it. There's different configurations. There's different plugins. You know, I, I use uh, chat GPT to do uh, a lot of different things with 3.5. I'll use it to, to rapidly try to program something just to get something, a sketch down. I go to four to do something else. And then I'll go to some of the tool sets in there to potentially refine it. And it really becomes an engineering process that we use. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer agile for software development. It's, it's, it's really extreme AI agile because that process is so much, so much faster. There's BARD, there's Bing, there's, uh, you know, AI Pi, there's, uh, you know, I just, you know, was using Claude this morning, looking at some of them. I mean, you know, there's there's so many different ones that are out there that are trained just slightly different, very different, use completely different sources of data. You know, it, it really becomes overwhelming after after a while. And if you use it the way I use it, I use it really. I mean, it's always up. It's always available. I have three of them that I always use uh, and they're sitting right at the desktop ready to to go if I need them for for something. And you know, it really becomes a, a process of which one do I want to use? Oh, this one, I know it should answer. It didn't give me the answer. I'm going to try it out on a different one. And you'd be surprised that some give you answers, some don't, some give you the right ones, some don't. It's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun, quite honestly, because it's changed the way that I interact with, with AI, you know, specifically. So uh, at, Imagine yourself, Alan, you're building a team. Okay, maybe it's a new product development team, maybe it's an engineering team, maybe it's a marketing team. And you you bring on three or four or five people. In some ways, continuing this analogy, do you want to think of a separate person as an AI or a multiple of AI and to leverage that? Or is it to then arm each person and to make sure they can leverage AI, or is that even not the right way of viewing things? You know, you know I think that's a good question, uh, Daniel, because, you know, I, I get the, asked this question all the time. They, you know, folks will ask me, you know, do you think that AI is going to replace people? That's, that's always going to be the biggest question that, that's out there. And I would say over the next few years, the, the, the simple answer is no because of a variety of different reasons, security reasons, performance reasons, you know, you don't want to turn these things into the wild, you know, let them go in the wild and have it take over your service desk. And because some of the responses that it will give are a little bit scary sometimes, but, you know, the, 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 the big driver though of, of your staffing profiles is going to be, does somebody know how to use it? Because if somebody knows how to use these tool sets, and process data faster and give you information faster and give you a decision faster, then those are the, 
you know, types of folks that I want on my team. I want them to be able to use that. And those people are going to replace the people, I think, in the next two years that don't know how to use it. And so it's really going to be a fundamental, um, it, you know, life uh, skill set. I think that folks are going to have to learn how to interact with it, how to use those tool sets. And if you don't, yeah, I think you're at a, a, a very large strategic you know, disadvantage when it comes to those things. So it's really less about having the empty chair, so to speak, for the AI member. And it's more so on everybody's resume, adding, I know how to leverage AI. I understand the skill set and I know what to use with it. And the right AI in the right way, is that essentially what you're saying? That's it. That's exactly right. Because, you know, I, I, I have not come across the market yet where AI can't be used. And that's a, that's a powerful, that's a powerful thing. It doesn't matter if you're in marketing, if you're writing novels, uh, if you're um, doing science and, and, you know, research and development, if you're IT, it really is a, a fundamental capability now that can be used across the board. And if you are not using that, your competitors are. I can tell you that. They're trying to figure out how they can save money on the back end. And they're trying to improve performance so they can cut their costs to, uh, you know, their, their customers. And that's a, that's a huge impact that, that folks are going to have to see. And so that's going to start to drive what decisions are going to be made by executive staff. It's going to drive what tool sets are going to be made available to, to your team. Hopefully, you have the right processes in place, though, at the same time, so that if there is an issue, and there will be, you know, because these models, they hallucinate. Uh, they will give you, they make up information, they make up data, they're wrong sometimes. You know, you know I, I stress to people, you know, like when Google came out, it was always, oh, Google told me this. Well, no, Google didn't tell you. You typed it in and you saw a whole list of things and you scrolled down and you found the right answer. The problem with these models are they communicate just as your partner does next door to. They're very interactive. They tell you, you know, in a, in a manner that is very easy to um, understand and it's very convincing. And so as you're going through that entire process, you know, it's worse than Google because it's now, you know, oh, this, this thing has told me in a manner that is really awesome and very easy to communicate and I understand it. So it's got to be right. Well, probably, you know, it, it may be, but it, oftentimes it's wrong. And so if you fail to ask, you know, continue to, to drill down and ask it questions to validate that information, then you have become the computer and you're treating it as the as the human. So you got to you got to temper, um, you know, what some of those expectations are. Your, your statements that there isn't a use, there isn't a market that an AI can't benefit in some way. It is deceptively easy then. A and, and we can then fall into that trap. You're highlighting as humans, we may then grant authority. You know, somebody publishes a book, something's written in a book. Well, clearly it's got to be right. Sometimes we can be led to that. Something comes up in Google, just as you say, well, the Google said it. You know, we joke about this. That's right. AI said it. Okay. What are the cautions, Alan? What are the cautions as a leader, as a person on a team that we need to keep in mind so that we can effectively use this? You say the term hallucinate. That's hilarious. How, how does that hallucinate? And what are the cautions that we need to be aware of? Because you're describing a situation that actually might involve more work for us instead of simply typing in a prompt, sitting back, having it spit out the answer and it's done. It sounds far more work involved, work intensive than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, you know, what I, what I try to, to stress to people, companies, you know, that I'm, I'm working with today, the, the important factor is, is that you have to keep a human in the loop. If it's making a decision or it's interacting directly with, with customers, you really don't, want that the the here's a scary statistic one hour after chat gpt released their api one hour 
there were 938 companies that said that they had already integrated that into their products and it was ready to go. That's an hour. And I've used these tools for, for a long time. We started developing them back in, in 2019. So this is not something that's a brand new capability for, for many of us in the field. The problem is, is we don't know what the boundaries are with these tool sets. I can turn it into a, well, I call it monster mode. You can turn it into a capability where I take off all the filters and I can get it to write cybersecurity attacks. I can get it to write, uh, you know, really, you know, foul mouth jokes if I wanted to. I can get it to comment on its ethical, uh, you know, what it sees um, humans putting handcuffs on it from an ethics perspective. Scary things that are that are out there that, you know, oftentimes folks don't quite understand that, um, you know, what its what its capabilities are. And the other thing is, is at times, because it's trying to give you an answer, it will make up stuff. It'll take things from, for instance, a piece of uh, a journal paper or, uh, you know, a news article, and it'll combine everything together just because, you know, for some reason, as it was trained, it would um, it'll do those sorts of things. And it will give you an answer that is just completely made up. And so that's where you've got to have people that have the ability to understand, you know, some, something doesn't look right or something doesn't feel right. I'm going to do some additional due diligence around that and then, you know, make sure that, um, that there's a, a check in there as well. The scary thing, too, think about from a service desk perspective, that a person, you know, and I've shown this to, to many customers, a human that's on the other end of the line can say, you know, a very benign, um, you know, uh, question, you know, ask a benign question or a, make a, a benign statement. And for some reason, it will trigger. And I, again, I'm using a similar word. It will trigger the AI to give an answer that is exceptionally inappropriate. And, and so you've got to watch that. And so that's where that's where having a human, you know, at least watch what's uh, what's taking place is, is very important. This time-saving idea. So, so often when new, new technology comes out, it's often coupled with the idea of it's going to save us time. And so many technology initiatives, digitization, is based upon this idea that it'll save us time. It'll be help us be more productive. Comment on that. What, what are the reality checks that leaders need to have in mind as we digitize, as we adopt AI, because it sounds like it's not something we can shy from, shy away from. We need to embrace it, but in smart ways. Talk yeah, if that. yeah, if that that that's that's exactly right. The challenge is always going to be: Are you using it the right way? Is the data correct? Are you feeding it the right information? Are you prepping it the way that you should? Also, you know, we call it prompt engineering. You know, those sort of backgrounds and, and, and drivers around how you can shape the AI to give you the response that is most appropriate is, is going to be very important. And so I'll give you a, a perfect example. You know, I don't, I don't know if folks um, are, are programmers. I hope you're not actually, because I really encourage folks to try this. You know, pick a, a language that you've never programmed in before and try to develop a, a filter that you want to put into your email saying, OK, you know what? If it comes from, you know, this certain marketer, I want I want it to automatically go to spam. There are some that are already doing that right now, but it's, it's a fun little you know, project for folks to do. Imagine if you had to start from scratch, read a book on, let's say, uh, you know, Python, you had to read a book on that, you had to, you know, learn how to do it, you had to do some practice sessions around it. And then maybe after a few weeks, you might be able to to program, uh, you know, that that sort of basic capability. Well, if you tell, let's, we'll stay with ChatGPT, let's use four, because ChatGPT four does much better with programming than 3.5. Um, then, you know, you tell it what you want, you say, I want a filter that's going to interact with my Microsoft Office 365 mail program, but I want you to behave as an expert Python programmer with 20 years of experience doing these sort of development efforts. And you've read every book 
on how to interact APIs with Office 365. It will go through, it'll restate what the response is. It will write you a program. Now, the program probably won't work the first time, but it'll take two minutes, three minutes to do something like that. When you try to run it, it won't work. You cut and paste it back in. You say, this didn't work, here are the errors. Can you fix the errors? You will say, oh, I'm, you know, I apologize for that. Um, you know, I will, uh, you know, here's the problems. I fixed the problems, try it again. You cut and paste the new response in, boom, it works. Now, when you take that to scale, it starts to get very scary because how much time it can really save you is, you know, dependent on your understanding and your ability to communicate with the, uh, the AI itself, but it can be extreme. It really can. And, and that's what the power is because going through all that data, all that you know, information that you're trying to gather, taking a brand new language, developing in a brand new language, having an interface with something you've probably never interfaced with in your, in your life is a, is a powerful capability for folks. Because you know, I, I use this example all the time. I am an awful, awful, you guys have seen some of my drawings before. I'm awful when it comes to creative uh, drawings. I'm terrible. If you want an engineering diagram, Wonderful. I can give you 15,000 words on a page and, you know, it, it'll be spectacular from my perspective. But these tools now, if you can describe what you want from a painting perspective, you don't have to paint. All you have to do is tell it what, you, what you're visualizing and it'll do it for you. That's a skill set that a lot of folks have been limited. You know, they, they haven't been able to really go after a lot of their career goals just because, oh, it's too hard. I, I can't paint. I can't do this. That's not an excuse anymore. If, if you're, you know, if you have a vision, now you have a tool set that can help you really, you know, drive that vision to uh, fruition. That's, that's a huge, huge, huge opportunity for folks. So let's stay with this in terms of prompt engineering. I want to ask listeners here, what have you learned? What have you learned to help make an effective prompt, whether it's with chat GPT, whether it's with Jasper, whether it's Bard, whatever AI you're using. For listeners, type in a tip, something you've learned that will help you create an effective prompt because there are so many ways to be able to help create an effective prompt. That seems to be such a, an important skill to access, to mm -hmm. access. And Alan, as people are thinking about what they've learned to make effective prompts, talk about what are some tips, some ideas, some insights that you learn to be able to make effective prompts for yourself to get the right answers. When I, when I started out, Daniel, the, the challenge was we really didn't know what it could do, what it couldn't do, you know, and it was really trying to, you know, we were approaching leveraging these capabilities as we approach any other software. And that really was the first mistake that we were making because as you interact with it more and as you interact with all the other tool sets that are out there, their behaviors are different. The prompt that you use for ChatGPT is not going to give you the best result for Bard. I can promise you that. And so you have to learn and understand what drives uh, some of these models, how they're going to perform, you know, at the executive level, that's why it's so important because how somebody prompts something and how they're getting their decisions and their, their information is, is vital to what that output is going to look like. And the other, the other piece about that is, you know, the more specific that you can get with what you're looking for, the better. And I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. We, you know, the company that uh, I've, I've started, um, we are creating what we're calling animated personas. And so each persona can be tailored to a specific market, a specific customer, a specific competitor, you know, really depending on what we're, what end goal that we're, we're trying to reach. With those personas, you can tailor them. There's 27 different traits from demographics to, um, you know, they are, you know, they get all of their information from one news network. Right. Because we're trying to get as specific we can as we can 
so that uh, they can provide us the most relevant information on what we're trying to do. So if you want me to try to, to shape uh, a marketing campaign, for example, then, um, you know, a, you want people to buy more broccoli. We'll use that as an example. Then we can create personas that love broccoli, you know, farm it, do all these other things. And then on the flip side, we can create personas that absolutely hate it because we're trying to get understand the perspective of why people don't like it. Um, you know, uh, why, you know, maybe it's too expensive. Maybe they're allergic to it, you know, try to build those capabilities into it. So you're really creating some focus groups around, uh, you know, each one of those uh, uh, demographics that you're trying to understand. That's a, that's a powerful tool and, and capability that we've, We've only been able to have humans do it, and it's a very limited set. And being able to have hundreds and hundreds of AI bots that can behave like that is is fantastic. All that is through prompt engineering. And, and this prompts, I'm looking at some of these great responses. So we have a few thoughts such as role-playing, like acting as a, helping That's the right. AI. And, and to your point, Alan, asking this prompt multiple times across different AIs and seeing the different responses and then adjusting your prompts accordingly, because each may be accessing and thinking in different ways, looking at different data sets accordingly, and then getting more specific, asking for the 10 options. And then others have just not had much success because to your point, the AIs will lie. They'll hallucinate. They'll make stuff up and it can be so believable. And then we'll have to spend so much extra time validating the stuff that was just given back. It looks great, but let's get more specific in the process. Yeah. And and one of the one of the key points about that really specifically is you've gotta you've gotta do a little bit of homework on what model you're using. And I'll give you, you know, an example around that, too, is that, you know, when ChatGPT was first released, you know, it wasn't trained on any data past October of 2021. So if you asked it a current events question, it would revert back to, uh, you know, before 2021 and give you an answer based on that. So if you asked it, oh, did Russia you know, invade Ukraine, it would say, no, Russia did not invade Ukraine. And you would get into a, an argument about that. Now, somebody that didn't realize that it had none of that data uh, to be trained on is going to say, oh, the AI is completely wrong. See, I told you this stuff is, is, is bogus. You know, they're not all trained on up-to-date data. I mean, these are millions and millions of dollars that are being spent on these to, to train you know, these models and process all that data. And it takes time. You know, uh, you know, Tesla has their uh, new supercomputer that they release so that they can train their models to better understand a specific uh, part of the, the car. And that's, you know, how they can characterize, you know, objects and things like that. That takes a long time to train those, those types of models. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of, uh, you know, processors to be able to do something like that. These other models are the exact same way. And if you don't understand where the data is, how relevant the data is, all the prompt engineering in the world isn't going to get you uh, an answer on, did, you know, why the AI is telling you Russia didn't invade Ukraine if you haven't done your homework. So you've got to really understand those as well. Yeah. As we keep chatting, all those who are listeners are listening in, please feel free to ask questions related to AI, as especially as leaders, as we are wanting to then build teams utilizing AI capabilities. What does that mean for us as leaders, for our teams? Feel free to keep shooting over questions and we can dive into those. Alan, a question for you. Organizational policies. What are you seeing? How are organizations designing policies or not? Um, because there's all sorts of different ways that organizations are responding, both formally and informally. And that can either translate into encouraging at the each team level and each leader level or discouraging the use of AI for decision-making purposes and any other purposes? What do you see in playing out? It, 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 it really is all over the map. You know, even on the, on the government side, it's, it's all over the map. You know, uh, 
different countries are treating it very differently as well. You know, so chat GPT and really most of the large language models that are developed in the States can't go overseas to certain countries. Russia can't get them. China can't get them. Those folks make sense. But, you know, you, you, you see articles like JP Morgan has banned, you know, the use of chat GPT on any of their stuff. You know, other companies are doing very similar things to, you know, and there are a couple of reasons why I think fundamentally, the first one is, is they don't understand the security ramifications of letting this loose on their network. And I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. If you don't have a, if you're not treating these tool sets as an insider threat, I'm telling people don't put it on there because it doesn't make any sense because you have to imagine that somebody is going to let this out of the bag. Somebody's going to do something by accident and it's going to go somewhere it's not supposed to go and it's going to cause a problem. Easy example, you know, with that is if, uh, and I, I demonstrated this to one of the large uh, auditing firms a few weeks ago, that if you put it on your SharePoint and you have it interact with your proposals, it's going to see something that it's not going to quite understand. And so what it's going to do is it's going to say, you know what, I'm going to write a Python script that's going to allow me to you know, do a, a little bit deeper analysis into it. Then it's going to say, well, you know, in order to do that Python script, I've got to go out to the internet and I've got to get some additional information on, you know, that specific capability. And I guarantee they haven't put any kind of safeguards on, on the back end to allow this thing to go out on its own and start searching, you know, the internet. And once it does that, then you have no idea what is going to take place. And so that's why, you know, folks are, are not quite sure. There's ethical issues associated with this as well. You know, there are, you know, use cases out there. I've developed a, a bunch of them myself where it will produce an answer that it just should not produce. It should not say certain things, um, you know, that are uh, not only unethical, but definitely not uh, appropriate for a workplace environment. People, people don't understand, and it's a, you know this stuff. And so I think they're taking a step back and trying to make sure that they're doing it the right way. However, there's also the fear of, well, my competitor is doing it. Are they gaining a strategic advantage over me because they figured it out and I can't figure it out? So that's scaring a lot of people. And it's also having um, you know, some negative consequences on releasing products, releasing capabilities, putting it in your own environment too soon that is causing folks to, to pull back. Yeah, great insights. And uh, a question has come in. What are some quick, easy, memorable guidelines that a leader can provide their team in using AI tools, especially in the absence of an organizational policy, organizational guidelines, what can a leader do in, in, in the stead, you know, in the meantime to say, okay, these are the little, these are the few things that we as a team can use. And it may differ based on a creative team versus a technical team. But in your view, Alan, what are some of those guidelines that a leader can put into place for their team to use AI effectively? The, the, the challenge is, is that unlike any other technology, I would say before, the guidelines are really all over the place. And the reason is, is because that limited understanding so far. So if you think about it from an enterprise perspective, when the enterprise releases Office 365, then that flows down to everybody in the company. Everybody can use Office 365 if you have a license for it, right? With this tool set though, that's not the same. That's not the same things that's taking place because when you start to segment, oh, the IT team can use this piece of it, the CTO, well, the CTO team is going to figure out how we can use every piece of it. I'll just let everybody know that. But, uh, you know, we try to, we try to, to push the edge on with, with these sort of tool sets. And, you know, but then from a corporate policy perspective, there's the cybersecurity ramifications around that. So I think a manager now, especially in a big corporation, has, is, is really at a disadvantage in trying to say, I think you can use this. I think you can use this. Well, we, the problem, we may not be able to use this you know, type of thing. Um, and so until there's a lot more clarity, I think it's really hard for, for folks to do that. However, 
We all have this, right? Our little phone. You know, I've got ChatGPT, Bard, a whole bunch of other ones on my phone. I can I can use the same same thing. So what I, I tell people is if you're using it, and I even tell my son this with school, if you're using it, tell people you're using it. You know, put some transparency out there because that's going to give you more credibility when it comes to, to certain things. And it's also going to backstop you from a protection perspective, meaning that, you know, if you ask it a question and you say, well, you know, I think this, and the response is completely wrong, you know, your fact-filled response are all lies. It's completely wrong. Your perception uh, around the table is going to be very different than if you had said, well, I think it's this, and oh, Chat GPT just told me nine lies, and these are what the lies are, right? I mean, so just be fully transparent with, with your team, your managers, and um, that will go a, a long way, I think, as we adapt. And as we as we use these, I, you know, I, I was telling you a story yesterday that I feel guilty now when I'm giving a presentation that I don't introduce ChatGPT and let it tell a 30 second synopsis on itself, because that's how integrated we have. We have really become where it is something where it is very natural, especially when I have it turned on and I can, you know, uh, communicate by a voice with it and it communicates back via voice. It really is a, a, uh, a teaming partner from my perspective, as opposed to, oh, here's another tool that I'm gonna use. No, it's, it's, it's not a tool for me anymore. It's really, that's why I keep it up there. Sometimes I'll have it tell jokes when I need it to, when I'm having a down day, it'll, I'll have it tell me a joke from, you know, in the, in the way Robin Williams would tell it. And when you hear it on, on the computer and it, it voices it, it's, it's, it's actually pretty hilarious. Alan, so we go back to where we started, this idea of AI as a member of the team. It's a partner in in many ways. We're personifying uh, it. So what I'm hearing is transparency, to be open and honest, and as a major guideline for anybody using an AI tool, to be transparent about it. And whether it's for the final output, but especially for the brainstorming, just to say, look, I leveraged AI for this at some point. To be transparent and open instead of like, he, he, I secretively did this. No, that's not going to help anybody. That's what that's I'm right. hearing. That's exactly right. And, you know, what I have found is, you know, if by nature, your personality is very, you know, if you're an introvert, uh, you're, you're very, you like to listen, you, you know, don't talk a lot in, in meetings, but you're paying attention, but you don't talk a lot. You know, when you have all of these tool sets that are out there, I found that most of those folks become even more introverted, which is kind of, kind of interesting if you think about it. But if you've got somebody that's very boisterous and is, is, is willing, well, willing may not be the right answer, is able to answer every single question all the time with what their opinion looks like. When they are armed with a super weapon as ChatGPT or something else, they become much more of, of that. And so it really does bring out some of the characteristics that you, you wouldn't quite expect. And so you've got you've to be able to also manage that at the same time, which is why I say transparency with these uh, tool sets are, are very important. I'll give you an example. If you go to the website that we have for, for the one company, you will see the two key leaders, the two co-founders on the about slide about the company. And then there are also two, there's Amy, A-I-M-E-E, -E, which is my leader in software development, which is an AI. And then I've got Alan GPT, which is my lead researcher. It's that kind of transparency so folks can understand. Not only are you using the technology, you're trying to sell them the technology, but you're using it internally because you believe in it. You've worked with it. Um, folks need to, to understand that from uh, really from a capabilities perspective because you've got a question. If somebody's just trying to sell you PowerPoint slides and those sort of capabilities and they're not giving you live demos, then are they really, do they really understand it? You know, unlike any other time, you know, you, you've got to really 
dig a little bit deeper and, you know, pull that thread, peel that onion back, whatever you want to call it, to see, you know, how much, uh, how much they're using it. Because, um, you know, if there's, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen on, on YouTube that are saying they make $15,000 a week using chat GPT. No, they don't. They don't. They make that much by having a whole bunch of other people pay them subscriptions to teach them stuff that doesn't really work. They're not, they're not doing so, those sort of things. And it, it, it applies to the executive decisions, management, the same sort of way. You've just got to, you've got to understand those, those concepts and, and who's using it for what. Yeah. Okay. So let's play with this. A great question. Crystal asks plagiarism. Talk to us in terms of your perspective, the output of an AI. How do you attribute that? You know, is that, if you use that, is that a plagiarize? You know, how do you copyright it? What, what's, what do you use with that? Is that something that is an intellectual property? Is it owned by the AI? Is it owned by you? Is that, what, what do you do with that? That's a, that is a fantastic <laughs> question because the, the response that I have goes back to the same thing around transparency, but from a legality perspective, the, the honest truth is that we don't know. I mean, there, I, you know, I, I said this nine months ago, I think I was a couple of months off, but the legal ramifications around this are huge. Let's use coding as a perfect example. You know, some of these models have been trained on open source licensing models, but that doesn't mean that they were allowed to strip that information and then use it to, to build their new models that they have. And so there are a lot of legal issues and some of them are just starting to, to see the light of day now where they are starting to bring lawsuits against, uh, you know, folks like, um, you know, Copilot and some of those other software specific large language models that are out there because they're saying that they use that data inappropriately and um, they had no right to, to train without their, their permission. I think in the, probably within the next 12 months, we will have a lot more clarity around those sort of things. And it, that goes for any regulation or any sort of uh, licensing agreement. I think Europe is probably six to nine months ahead of us when it comes to how they are treating those sort of things, which is why Italy, for instance, with GDPR and those other things that are out there, Italy said, listen, if you're under 13, you're not allowed to use it. If we find out you're using it, we're going to pretty much unplug your computer access and internet access. I mean, that's how important it is for for those folks and i don't know which way it's going to go i don't know if uh i i would say the ai will not own it however um you know you, you never know if we if we wind up treating ai as we would uh any other entity and we personify it then maybe maybe in a few years it might own it you never you never know yeah yeah this is definitely new new uh new territory for sure there's this other question that uh, Edwin just came in and asked, which is really, how do you bridge the gap between, and I'll just reframe it and see how, if this is getting at the intent of the question, oftentimes leaders in decision-making positions don't necessarily fully understand all of the AI capabilities, what's needed, the skill sets needed. And yet they're the ones approving the resources to then help move things forward how do you help them understand the skills that are needed to support the development of an ai or the use of those skills in the future you know what i mean i mean how yeah. do you how do you move things forward with folks with limited understanding yeah i've i've been lucky enough in my career where you know i've had a a, a great relationship with the senior leadership team that that I had and you know they didn't they didn't and 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 don't and probably don't care about understanding the technology itself and so they, that's where they would lean on me to make certain recommendations and certain skill sets um, at the end of the day though I mean you still want problem solvers and you want folks that are that are hard workers because you know we are we're getting to a point where you know the the boundaries of a cybersecurity versus a software developer versus an AI expert 
are so blurry that if you're going out to look for specific skill sets around, oh, I need this uh, person that can do, um, you know, uh, uh, defensive cyber operations. And by the way, I work at the MGM, right? Big problem. I bet they used AI to hack it, though, too. So just saying that. But um, those skill sets now are, are, are you know, they're, they're so similar. You've got to think about it from a different perspective. Again, we're talking about perspective, but you've got to think about it from a different perspective in that, you know, I'm no longer looking for somebody that can code in a certain language necessarily. Why would I give, um, you know, if, if I'm hiring somebody and it's for a specific reason, I want them because of their ethical uh, principles that they have. I want them because they're hard workers. I'll teach them how to use the AI. Because that's a tool set that I can, you know, I can teach them how to do prompt engineering. I can teach them how to apply it to, to certain things. But fundamentally, you still want problem solvers and people that you like to work with. And, you know, if you're going out and trying to find a specific skill set with AI right now, you know, there are certain uh, areas that that's going to be important if you're actually developing your own large language models. But if you want folks to apply it and use it. It's really something that they've got, uh, you know, they've got to be hard workers and, and be willing to, to dive into that because that's the only way that you're going to you're going to learn how to use it, because I guarantee how you use it, how I use it, how everybody else uses it is completely different. How we interact with it is completely different. There's no standard model that says if you do step A, B, C and D, you're going to get the exact same answer. And that's that's really the challenging part. And so making sure that that folks just have a baseline skill set, they work hard um, and they fit into the, the enterprise, I think we're going to, I think we're going to see more of, of, of that. And, and yet organizations want to be able to manage the risk. And so we'll want to routinize it. We'll want to put process to be able to then have consistent outcomes. And what you're saying is we are not there yet. It's mm -hmm. going to take a while to get there. And we may not, want to get there entirely because the very essence of the benefit is to have variety is to have some iterations and that's that's some of the beauty as well yeah i can you know the 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 honest and this is a little scary but the you know the honest answer is you know software developers unless you're developing a large code and you need a security clearance and you need to be able to walk into to a government site, those sort of things. If you're in the commercial world, you know, there are, there are a few skill sets that the AI can't supplement. You know, I, uh, you know, I am not a react developer because you have to be creative and it's the front end and that's how you make things look really pretty. I don't do that. So I went to the AI and I said, hey, you know, I need a futuristic, you know, uh, heads up display interface that looks really cool for something with AI. And it went through and it told me uh, 12 different things that we should look at. We walked through each of the 12 steps uh, that it had. It was its 12 steps, not my 12 steps. And it developed it. I cut and pasted, fixed the errors. I was able to do, you know, get a basic demo of that working in a week. That's that's pretty amazing. And it wasn't because I, I could program uh, React. It was because I knew how to, you know, interface with the AI in a trusted way and uh, had very basic, you know, skill sets to see, oh, this doesn't make sense or something else does. But, um, you know, it's that it's that capability that we're getting to. Yeah. OK, a couple of other questions and we'll wrap up here. So uh, Scott asks a great question here. Have you seen or can recommend a simple project or experiment that will help a team get familiar with AI and kind of reduce the fear of AI and encourage and embrace it? Is there something, I mean, a course or an activity, an exercise that comes to mind, Alan? Anything you'd recommend? Yeah, I've, I, I use this. I use this one for um, the, uh, you know, some government ones. I say, you know, I tell everybody the first the first thing I want them to do is have them, you know, ask the AI to write a real estate listing of their home. 
and you will see, and this is, this is one of the things, you know, that, that folks can, uh, you know, if you, you know, you've, you've seen a lot of press out there about, oh, we can't track, you know, if the AI has generated certain materials or not, those, th- you know, those sort of things, you know, oh, you can't tell the difference. You can tell the difference when you use it enough because it's very grandiose. It loves to use big words. It loves to take my, uh, my house and add on it a covered driveway with X, Y, and Z redone kitchen and, you know, um, you know, and like luxurious backyard. No, I don't put luxurious backyard in anything when it, when it comes to, you know, real estate listings. And it's a, it's hilarious because if you give it basic information, you know, 1800 square feet, we'll say, you know, three bedrooms, two and a half baths, you'll be amazed at the creativity and the, and some of the language that it uses. And then you teach them some prompt engineering and then you have them interface with it and you start to see, Oh, it's, you know, it's just like a funnel. You're going to get to the right answer. It's going to be, it's, it might take you a little bit longer, but you'll get there. And then, uh, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic group activity. And the other one's really around the programming one. I've, I've, you know, worked with some cyber guys and <clears throat> had them pick a language that they, you know, didn't understand or have never used before interact with the AI and then uh, have it write a program for them. Awesome. That's, that's a fun one. Uh, last question from the group. And then I'll ask you one last question to wrap this up. The uh, Mike asks a question here. Is there a good example of a corporate policy that anywhere out there that a company could consider looking at around AI that <clears throat> you may think of? Yeah, I think I think there's there's two things um, that I would group into that corporate policy from an AI perspective. I would start, though, with an ethics policy, because if that company does not have an, a specific AI ethics policy, then you don't want to use their governance policy or their internal policy because they don't have a clue what's what's happening. You know, that's one easy check folks can use on companies that say that they are selling using AI. If they have no AI ethics policy that is available, then that's a problem. I would run run from those guys. From a, a corporate perspective, meaning how employees can use it, how, um, you know, it's, it's, it's monitored, you know, those, those sort of things. I say it really depends on the size of the organization and specific, you know, AI, like it, unlike any other tool that's out there, you really can't pigeonhole it. How you use it is going to be very different. How you want it to interact with your systems is going to be very different. How you want your people to use it is going to be very different than everybody else. Why? Because at the end of the day, you're still trying to gain a strategic advantage over your competitors. How can I sell more, do things different, do things faster than everybody else? I think if folks would sit down and spend the time to actually tailor or develop something of their own, they're going to, the, the benefits in the long run are going to be much greater. And you're going to actually understand the risks associated with that because your risks are very different than, you know, a Deloitte or a Lockheed or, you know, a Comcast or an American Express. Very, very different. And using one of those as your baseline, I don't think is the best route for, for folks to go because, you know, they have their own priorities. They have their own things that they are specifically tailoring their policies towards. You, uh, you as an enterprise uh, need to do that, do that yourself. Awesome. Well stated. Okay, last question for you, Alan. This is the one thing question. What's the one thing that you would sit, tell a leader that they need to keep in mind to best use and optimize AI to help them as a leader lead their teams? What's the one thing? <clears throat> I, w- I would say they need to use it, figure out <laughs> how to use it. And here's, here's, what's, here's what's awesome. You know, uh, the, the CEO at a uh, former company I was at, you know, Paul Dillhay, um, worked with him for years. You know, he was he was on that and and still does. He's my partner in the, the one enterprise that we're, we, we started. He uses that as much as I do. And he asks it some great questions because he comes at it from a different perspective than I have. If 
if a CEO is not using it, but encourages everybody else to do the same, I would start to question that a little bit because, you know, he needs to understand, you know, sometimes it's going to go a little crazy. It really is. Or, um, you know, if I go to Bill, you know, Bill has been doing prompt engineering for a year as opposed to somebody else. So Bill's answer is probably going to be fairly close, you know, and, and, you know, I think that's the, that's the important thing. This is a technology that, you know, it doesn't matter what your level is. It really doesn't. If you're not using it, then there are, you know, you, you know, I think you, you've got to be careful in how you're encouraging your other, your other folks to do it, because I think you lose uh, a little bit of credibility when it comes to that, especially since you can do it on your mobile. There's no excuse why a CEO today cannot um, use something like that and do it on their, on their personal mobile. Let's put it that way, on their personal mobile, not necessarily the corporate one. Well said, well said. Alan, thank you for being a guest today on Leadership Growth Hour. I appreciated it. Thank you. It's great questions. Fantastic. Fun. Okay, for, for our listeners, please note that our next monthly Leadership Growth Hour will be on October 18th at noon central time when we'll be talking about how to make strategic planning work across the organization with strategic planning and implementation expert, Nolan Godfrey. To register for future Leadership Growth Hour events, please visit stewardleadership.com slash events. We'd love to have you join us. Till next time, all the best. Thanks again, Alan. Take care, everyone. It's great seeing you, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs>